Knights Templar, a secret brotherhood born in the throes of the Middle Ages, only to vanish after two centuries in existence. Of these men who left their mark on history, remains the legends that made them famous. Their white overcoats bearing the iconic red cross. The riches they amassed. Their discipline and ferocity in battle. These were the elite troops, the special forces of the 12th century. After 700 years, mysteries still surround the myth of these soldiers of Christ. Are they priests? Are they monks? Are they knights? What are they? As an English chronicler called them a certain new monster. In this episode, we explore the truth behind the treasures of the Templars. There was a central treasury at the headquarters of the order where they kept both cash and precious materials, relics. Thanks to the greatest experts on the Order of the Temple, along with an investigation where the only written evidence of this period is preserved, we reveal how the Knights Templar became masters in the art of generating wealth. Sheep farmers, agriculture, cloth trade, tile factories, water mills. If there's a way of making money, the Templars would be involved. We see more and more donations pouring in. A heritage is being built in many regions of the West. From the construction of super fortresses in the East to the management of the treasure of the kings, discover the astonishing economic and financial organization perfected by the members of the Order of the Temple. They had 141 domains all over England and Wales. These were corporations that were bound to invest and uh, maximize the profits through very, very rational type of behavior. These would have been spread across Europe, from Scotland in the north, right the way down to southern Italy, or the Christian kingdoms of Spain. Their incomes were far greater than that of most kings. This is the real story of the treasure of the Templars. Knights who became bankers and investors, willing to do anything to finance their war in the Holy Land. Jerusalem, mid-12th century. Since the taking of the city in 1099 by the Crusaders, the Christian armies attempt to preserve their possessions in the Holy Land. At the time, the Eastern Latin states, located along the Mediterranean Sea, consisted of the Principality of Antioch, the County of Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Surrounded on all sides and facing increasingly powerful enemies, fighting in the region is permanent. Among the knights present on the battlefield, certain warriors donning white coats emblazoned with a red cross stood out. The Knights Templar. Both monk and soldier, they are members of a brotherhood created at the beginning of the 12th century under the high authority of the Pope himself, the Order of the Temple. Their mission to defend Christians on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. In just 30 years, this new breed of knights had become increasingly popular among the kings and peoples of Western Europe. In Western Europe at this time, knights were extremely competent on the battlefield, but they were also perceived to be arrogant. They might embark on things like single-handedly attacking an enemy's uh, line. They might refuse to adhere to orders. The Knights Templar weren't like that. The fact that they were also religious by their vocation meant that they were a lot more sober in their conduct of war. They were just as competent, they trained the whole time, but they were looking at a much more disciplined formation of troops. They didn't break rank. They were expected to work in very close formation to fight in a sober but very intense manner. They were not there to show off, they were there to conduct that role. 
The various uh, Muslim commanders generally viewed the Templars as the most dangerous troops in the Crusader states. An indicator of just how feared they were as soldiers is that often after a battle, all the Templars were executed. The Muslim commander couldn't afford to keep them alive. They were too dangerous. At their head is a knight referred to as the Grand Master. The first of them, Hugues de Pain, founder of the Order of the Temple, died in 1136. Robert de Crau and then Everard Desbar succeeded him. In 1152, a fourth Grand Master was elected at his turn, Bernard de Tremolay. It was he who in 1153 was to distinguish himself in a battle that became famous, the capture of Ascalon. At the time, the city was a Muslim enclave within the kingdom of Jerusalem. Attacks could therefore be easily launched from Ascalon against the Christian states. For five months, the army of the kingdom of Jerusalem tried to retake the city. The troops were composed of a motley mix of Latin soldiers who occupied the Holy Land and members of military orders of the time. Among them, several hundred Knights Templar had come to lend a hand to the army of the King of Jerusalem. Ascalon was a Fatimid shield that protected Egypt in a way. And the Christians really wanted to consolidate the southern border of Jerusalem and had long held the idea to take it over. In 1153, the Kingdom of Jerusalem besieged the city. And the siege, at the start at least, went very badly. And it was really when the commands were beginning to discuss whether it could succeed at all, they decided to stage a final assault. And the Knights Templar went in first. The Templars entered through a breach, but they entered alone. And the Muslims, once the Templars entered the city, closed in around them. It's believed that about 40 Templars died in Ascalon, following their master, Bernard de Tremolay. So the Templars paid a very heavy price to take Ascalon. But Ascalon was obviously an important moment. And since so much has been said about this battle, no doubt much has also been said about the driving and leading role the Templars played there. The Second Crusade and the taking of Ascalon will further advance the fame of these Knights of Christ ready to die to protect the Holy Land. In the second half of the 12th century, the Knights Templar began to take an increasingly important place in the armies of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and other Eastern Latin states. The Knights Templar from the middle of the 12th century onwards gained considerable popularity in the West. For the faithful, praying in a temple church, being buried in a temple cemetery, associating with a brotherhood linked to the temple, are all pious deeds. They are meritorious acts. One hopes in this way to achieve one's salvation, all the more so as the order of the temple is committed to the defense of Christ's heritage, to the defense of the kingdom of Jerusalem. We see more and more donations coming in, a heritage is being built up, and networked commanderies are being set up in many parts of the West, which is proof of the popularity of an order that more and more writers and thinkers in the West are beginning to talk about. In Paris, in the vaults of the National Archives, there are millions of documents classified by date and relating the history of France. Perfectly preserved documents have recently been found from reserves dating back to the 12th century. They have provided new evidence of the frenzy of donations to the Templars that took hold in Europe very soon after the creation of the order.
The first document dates from 1144. It is an appeal for donations from Pope Celestine II. Here's an edict from the Pope indicating that the Templars are the defenders of the faith in the East, but that they don't have enough income, and that in order to carry out their expeditions, they need the faithful to contribute to providing them with what they need. And so it allows all those who give of their own possessions, their own goods, their own money to the order of the Temple to have a pardon of one-seventh of the penances they would have to make for their sins. This is the purpose of this appeal to the people, a kind of generalized contribution, incentivized a little bit. The Order of the Temple thus receives donations from all parts of the population. The Templars themselves contribute to the development of their institution by renouncing their possessions in favor of the Order. This document shows a knight who has just entered the temple in the Holy Land and who decides to give up his lands in Picardy. In the name of the holy and inseparable Trinity, amen. I, Raoul de Rosson, for the salvation of my soul and my family, have pledged to God and to the house of the knighthood of the temple 80 hectares of land, and I have conceded that they freely possess it forever in peace. From here, I receive the garments of this same house and give myself as its servant. This document is very rare because it's both the contribution of a small knight from Picardy and also the entrance to the temple of this knight. This act indicates that he entered into the order of the temple. We have someone who was on a crusade. He left with all the king's army, with his Count Raoul, Count of Soissons. And then he entered into the order of the temple and gave what he had, a land very, very far from Jerusalem. So it's really a document that came back from the Holy Land. It's super spectacular, extremely rare. French nobles also participate in the fundraising. The proof is this document dating from 1159 and signed by Henry II, Count of Champagne. He decides to make his contribution in cash. I, Henry, Count Palatine of Troyes, notify the present and future that my father, Count Thibault, had given seven silver marks to the brothers of the temple. I, for the salvation of his soul and mine, have given to them 24 pounds from the tax of Troyes, 12 from the saint Rémy Fair, and 12 from the saint Jean Fair. And I granted them that they shall possess these in perpetuity. And in order that this may be established, I have commanded that it be written down and that it be confirmed by the imprint of my seal. The tonneau is the tax that weighs on sales and purchases. It's a trade tax, in fact. Champagne fairs are booming, they're very rich. And it gives them a very precise annual income, which allows them to accumulate cash each year. The people, the knights, the nobles, but also the kings. Richard I, known as Richard the Lionheart, King of England at the end of the 12th century, will also be a fervent defender of the Templar cause. It's one of the rare documents of Richard the Lionheart, King of England, Duke of Normandy, who validates all of the goods of the Order of the Temple in Normandy since he's the Duke of Normandy. Richard, by the grace of God, King of the English, Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou, we confirm the donations made to the Brothers of the Knights Templar of Solomon's Temple in Normandy. Land, villages, or men, they will pay neither tax duty nor tolls on passage. This act is addressed to the archbishops, bishops, seneschals, my agents, and my faithful throughout Normandy. This act was implemented in this form, or in the form of authentic copies, to all of the financial and administrative institutions of the Duchy of Normandy.
This set of documents clearly shows the convergence of protections. In each kingdom, the sovereigns provide protection and donations. And within each principality, each county, there are particular donations that are made according to the income that can be mobilized for the Templars. A whole system that is both political and economic, set up and emanating from authorities at very different levels. Thanks to these donations, the network of Templar commanderies, where the members of the order responsible for growing the assets of the temple live, is being rapidly expanded. Over time, the leaders of the Order of the Temple learn to function as administrators of these properties and land holdings. There were many donors with varied types of properties, a plot of land here, a large farm there, sometimes with geographical variations. And so they had to manage this in an organized way. So over time we see there are regroupings of properties, exchanges of land. There's a parcel that suits us better here, so we give up another one there. It was something very common. The commanderies were also established near land that could be easily developed. They used the road networks, the river networks, not only for hydraulic equipment, but also for navigation, possibly on rivers. And then the roads allowed them to move their goods more easily to the Holy Land, through the ports of Marseille, Aigues-Mortes, Montpellier, the equipment, the horses, and all the men. They still had to be close to transportation networks because the ultimate goal was to draw all these products to the ports of the Mediterranean. We don't know exactly how many commanderies the Templars had, but something in the region of 900 seems reasonable. And these would have been spread across Europe, from Scotland in the north, right the way down to southern Italy, or the Christian kingdoms of Spain. In each of these commanderies, you have 30, 40, 50 people, so we're talking about literally thousands. We could think of the Knights Templars having some sort of eastern and western flanks to it. The order in the east was a military operation designed to defend the Christian Holy Land. In the west, however, the Templar properties weren't really military bases at all. They were financial centers where they would generate the wealth to support the operations in the east. So it was kind of a combination of, you know, military in the east and, you know, business in the west, effectively. They were sheep farmers. They were, you know, heavily involved in agriculture and, you know, the cloth trade. They ran orchards, tile factories, water mills. You name it, the Templars were involved. If there's a way of making money in the West, the Templars would be involved. It sounds like they're very financially greedy, but they weren't. They were very astute businessmen, and they were doing everything to support their crusading in the East. In England today, there are still traces of the many Templar commanderies, such as the Cressing Temple. One of its barns is known to be the oldest wooden barn in the world. Crescent Temple was, I think, the first domain that was given in England to the Templars. It was donated in 1137 by Queen Matilda. It quickly became one of the biggest and one of the most important, perhaps the most important domain in England. It comprised of 700 acres of land. It is situated in a very strategically important point. It's in Essex, so it's halfway between London and uh, the port of Harwich. Port of Harwich was one of the most important ports in that period. After the Crescent Temple, donations from English aristocrats to the Temple Order continued to flow in. Commanderies then appear in the counties of Essex, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, and then gradually throughout the English territory. It was really the 13th century that saw the peak of the nation period. 
Henry III of England in particular was a keen supporter of the Templars, and you have more and more nobles who were mimicking the royal behavior. We can say that the order possessed the single largest number of landed estates in England. They had 141 domains all over England and Wales, and uh, we're talking about something that comprising at least 60,000 acres, out of which 30,000 acres were under direct cultivation. The Templars were certainly one of the richest institutions uh, in England. They were really trying to maximize profits of productivity on local domains. They were actually exhibiting very, very similar mentality and behavior to what we see today in the 21st century. I mean, these were very, very rational corporations that were bound to invest and uh, maximize the profits through very, very rational type of behavior. On each manor, you would have a special officer called bailiff or steward that was in charge of uh, agricultural activities and uh, sowing local crops, overseeing livestock. And it was also responsible for marketing the produce, both the, the arable produce and the livestock produce. In the National Archives of England, located in Kew near London, are the only archives from this period that give a precise idea of the holdings of the Templar commanders and the money they generated each year. This information, written in Latin, was kept on scrolls of sheepskin parchment that have been preserved over the centuries. Much like accounting ledgers, these scrolls contain all the details, the quantities produced, and the sums of money spent and collected by the commandery. Every domain has its own clerk that was uh, recording what was going on there. The bailiff will tell him how much was made this year, how much was spent this year, how much was harvested this year, how many new animals were born, how many new animals died, how many animals were purchased, how many were sold, and how many were transferred to other places. And the clerk would just record it in a very meticulous manner. Those clerks were very well trained writers. They would be usually using a goose feather. They would dip it into an ink, usually brown color, and they would just execute it in very, very fine calligraphic script. Once uh, the entire membrane would be covered, they would be given another membrane. Once the whole account would be ready, they would just stitch several membranes together and they would create this uh, huge roll. Here, the accounts of the commandery of Temple Brewer in Lincolnshire, in the east of England. The domain of Temple Brewer in Lincolnshire is uh, located on a little bit infertile land, which is much better uh, suited for livestock rearing rather than uh, crop production. We harvested 73 quarters of wheat, 3 quarters of rye, 40 quarters of barley, 46 quarters of dredge, and 162 quarters of oats. But even there, we see that they were able to diversify the crop production. There were some pockets of wheat, barley, rye, and especially oats, because uh, on this type of land, you really want to concentrate on the oats as much as possible. But it really was the livestock sector that played an enormously important role on that particular manor. Temple Brewer was the single richest manor in terms of the number of sheep. It stocked 4,500 sheep, which was a really remarkable number. Sheep were very, very profitable because English wool was uh, one of the most uh, sought after commodities. It was both relatively inexpensive and uh, of fine quality. It attracted lots of merchants, especially from Italy. Another account roll from an area also located in Lincolnshire shows that the English Templars were not content to sell their products only in local markets. They were also present on the international trade market. We produced 3,002 fleeces of wool, which together weighed 5,000 pounds. On this scroll, for example, the buyer of the wool is specified, the company Ballardi, one of the most important Italian wool merchant families of the time. With the sales of these products, each Templar commandery generated considerable revenues. 
In that year, we made 315 pounds, eight shillings, eight pence and a quarter. If we take all the uh, landed estates of the Templars uh, in a given year, and an average year you would expect the Templars to generate the income of approximately 4,500 pounds a year. And we're talking about something that can be translated into a six-digit figure today in contemporary money, so we're talking about something that uh, could in some years actually exceed how much the king would have made. The Knights Templars' possessions, both in Western Europe and in the Crusade Estates, were truly substantial. They had enormous land holdings, which made them one of the largest landowners anywhere in Western Christendom. Their incomes were truly substantial, far greater than that of most kings. The income of each English commandery was transferred to the headquarters in London at Temple Church, where the order's possessions were consolidated and accounted for. Over the years, the members of the Order of the Temple improved their expertise in economic development and the management of their money, so much so that they became bankers to the kings. They kept their accounts with scrupulous care. They were very cautious with their investments and so on. And, you know, they also worked really hard as well. The Templars have been described as being the one medieval institution that did the most for the rise of modern capitalism. That sounds a bit materialistic. But if you think about it, the Templars were sworn to defend the Holy Land, and everything they did had that aim in mind. That was their official raison d'etre, was defending the Holy Land. The Templar Order didn't just bring together people who wanted to fight. It brought together people from a whole range of different backgrounds, including people who had various trades or artisan skills, and indeed skill with money. With this, they were able to develop their estates, conduct huge building programs, but also to become very able financiers, so able, in fact, that they were employed by both the kings of France and England to run their treasuries. The Temple Church, in the eyes of the Templars and also in the eyes of the royal family and the nobility, will be considered as a safe uh, deposit box. You could either deposit your own valuables, your money, your jewels here, and you can be quite sure that uh, they're in good hands. But also, all the profits in money that would be flowing from different estates would actually end up here. Obviously, there were escorted convoys with safes, hutches as they were called, made of wood with the cash inside, which were transported from financial center to financial center. In France, as in England, money circulated from the commanderies to the regional financial centers and then to Paris. This is where the headquarters of the order was located, in the Temple Tower. There was a central treasury at the headquarters of the order, where they had both cash and precious materials, relics, the Great Tower of the Temple in Paris served as a sort of safe for several depositors. The king, first of all, so everything that was not spent on site in the provinces and that came back from the bailiffs, from the guards of the kingdom, went back to Paris and was stored in the Temple Tower. The policy of the French sovereigns toward the Templars didn't change one iota throughout the 12th and 13th centuries. That is to say, for Philip II, who entrusted them with his treasure definitively, and all the other sovereigns like Saint-Louis, the king's treasure was kept in the temple tower, and that's where the money was taken, that's where it was brought to. And also, in the only accounting that remains for the end of the 13th century, we see that apart from the king, there were about 60 depositors. So it was private depositors who put their money in the temple tower out of convenience because the management was also carried out by the Temple Brothers on site. This document, dating from the 13th century, is one of the rare few that survived. I, Brother Jean de Tour, treasurer of the House of the Temple of Paris, certify that we have received and kept in deposit from the executors of the will of Mr. Jean, Cardinal of Saint-Cécile, 
the sum of 9,000 pounds, a sum which the same cardinal bequeathed in his will, on condition that 3,000 pounds be allocated to support operations in the Holy Land. This is a receipt signed by the treasurer of the Tower of the Temple, which certifies the deposit of 9,000 pounds, a sum equivalent to 250,000 euros today. These few lines are enough to imagine the amount of money that the Templars managed. We never knew exactly how many people, but some receipts show that there were probably several accountants on site, apart from the king's accountants who were still there managing the king's money. But the brothers of the temple had several agents on site who daily take care of collecting and dispersing the necessary sums to their so-called clients. The purpose of this financial organization is to fund the needs of the war in the Holy Land. These funds are sent to the east from Paris. So they go through the Mediterranean ports. They're sent to Marseille or Montpellier, and from there, they're shipped by boat. The establishment of secure financial transport networks and safes within depository banks enabled the Templars to set up an innovative system specifically intended for pilgrims to use on their journey to the Holy Land. They developed a system of credit notes where you could basically treat the Templars as a bank. You could deposit money in their Templar preceptory in Paris. And when you went on pilgrimage, you could go to Jerusalem and, you know, you go to the, the Temple House in Jerusalem and say, well, I've deposited a certain number of livres in Paris. I need to get money out to fund the rest of my pilgrimage. Thanks to this deposit system, the pilgrim could travel without risking being robbed on his journey. And in this way, the Templars made pilgrimage to the Holy Land simpler and, above all, safer. With a network of strongholds scattered throughout the region, the Templars are able to fight against enemy attacks. They were able to hire the best architects and masons, and they ended up building what are you know, masterpieces of medieval you know, military architecture. Castles like Atlit, for instance, which was possibly the Templars' most celebrated castle, was actually a fortified peninsula. It was completely impregnable. And it even withstood attack while it was still being built. That was how strong it was physically. I mean, the walls were something like 15 feet thick. This was a way of announcing that the Templars were, you know, the mightiest power in Christendom that wasn't a king. You know, they were a real force to be reckoned with. And these castles were incredibly strong. Templar castles take many forms. You've got the really big frontier castles, which were there to protect against attack or to act as staging points for invasion. But you've also got many castles away from the frontier, too. Often these could act as estate centres, the, the middle of large agricultural lands, and therefore consolidation point for those areas. Trapezac, Chastel Blanc, Chastel Arnoux, Chateau Pellerin, Safed. There are dozens of Templar fortresses throughout the region. Today, remains of the Templar Knights can be found in Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Cyprus, Jordan, Syria, and Turkey. These traces testify to the power of the Order of the Temple in the Holy Land at that time. The most exposed border crossing in the 12th century, where the Knights Templar had many fortresses, was located in the north of the Principality of Antioch, in a region called the Amanus Mountain, on the borders of what is now Turkey and Syria, where the Knights Templar had established at least half a dozen castles. 
On the pilgrimage route that connects the port of Jaffa to Jerusalem, the Templars are known to have separated their fortresses in a regular fashion, about a day's walk between each of them. But despite the large sums of money accumulated in the West, the need for funding for the war in the East continues to grow. The Latin states are under constant threat of attack. And with more threats comes the need for more knights, more food, more weapons, and more castles to build, fortify, and protect. The cost of maintaining the numbers of knights that they did in the Crusader states, as well as their engagements elsewhere, was absolutely enormous. The build cost of a single Templar castle was 1.1 million bezants. In modern day money, that would probably run to billions, but we're looking at set monies substantially larger than the incomes of an average king to build that one castle. And the Templars own tens of castles in the Crusader States, and that's before we start talking about the ports they have to maintain, the pilgrimage routes, the troops, their estates, and all the other things that have a call on their finances. At the end of the 12th century, the military situation is increasingly tense, especially because in the midst of all the Muslim forces that are tearing each other apart in the region, a new leader is on the rise, Saladin. Born in present-day Iraq, Saladin is the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty that succeeded in unifying Egypt and Syria and in conquering Yemen. He quickly establishes himself as the main threat to the Eastern Latin states, and in particular, to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Probably the Kingdom of Jerusalem was not his main goal. But when he conquered Egypt, of course, this strip of land that included the Kingdom of Jerusalem was already surrounded by the Muslims. So it seemed really difficult to provide a defense for it. At the time, the King of Jerusalem was called Guy de Lusignan. The kingdom is composed of several fiefdoms, each controlled by its own lord. Among them, the lordship of Ultra Jordan. At its head, Renaud de Chatillon, known for his acts of violence. In 1187, he attacked a Muslim caravan of civilians who passed through his territory on their way from Cairo to Damascus and plundered all their property. This event triggers the anger of Saladin himself. To take revenge, he orders an attack on the fortress of Karak, capital of Ultra Jordan. The king of Jerusalem senses that the situation could escalate. He turns to his closest advisor, Gérard de Ritfort, 10th Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. Gérard de Ritfort was a very important man in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Faced with the threat posed by Saladin, Guy de Lusignan sent Gérard de Ritfort as his ambassador to the Count of Tripoli. The King of Jerusalem aims to form an alliance with the Count of Tripoli to confront Saladin. But on his way, Gérard de Ritfort would prove to be reckless. Overconfident, he attacks a Muslim contingent by mobilizing only 140 knights. Badly underestimating the situation, he finds himself up against a force of 7,000 men. The battle, named after the springs of Crescent, where it takes place, is a true massacre. The defeat was total. Most of the Templars engaged, about 80 brothers, died, and very few escaped, including the master. Gérard de Ritfort, far from the teachings of his distinguished predecessors at the head of the Order of the Temple, decided to listen only to his pride. Offended to have been defeated in battle, he pushes Guy de Lusignan, king of Jerusalem, to counterattack. As Saladin's troops besiege Tiberius, the Christians make their way to the city to challenge them. 
Guy de Lusignan therefore went on the offensive, deciding to go after Saladin with the entire Jerusalem army, up to 20,000 men maybe. They engaged in very steep, very dry regions in the middle of summer between Sephoria and Tiberias. And there, they were surrounded by Muslims. It is in Hattin, near Lake Tiberias, that one of the bloodiest battles of the 12th century will take place. Exhausted and parched, the Christian troops are far too weak to hold their own against Saladin's men. On July the 4th, 1187, the battle opened at Hattin in the worst conditions for the Christians. The Templars showed a certain heroism, but their defeat was total. There were many dead and even more prisoners. We know that a lot of um, the courtesans around Saladin took like an honor to behead uh, Templars that had fallen into their hands. This probably because they were perceived as uh, fanatics for their religion, for Christianity. The Templars were executed by Saladin, but the master was taken into captivity in Damascus for Saladin to use him as a bargaining chip so that the Brotherhood would hand over the fortresses of Gaza and Daron. That's how, in 1187, the Kingdom of Jerusalem collapsed within a few months. And the master of the temple at the time, Gérard de Riedfort, carries in this debacle a significant share of responsibility. The Kingdom of Jerusalem only had one army. It didn't have the depth of military manpower to be able to raise new forces. And so at Hattin, the Christian army wasn't simply defeated, it was annihilated. There really was nothing stopping Saladin from conquering the remainder of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem fell a few months later. Less than a century after Christians took Jerusalem in the First Crusade in 1099, the holy city again fell to the Muslims. When news of the loss of Jerusalem and the Battle of Hattin got to Western Europe, it caused a tremendous outcry. The Pope is said to have died from the shock. In Jerusalem, Christians are forced to leave the holy city, and the residence of the temple takes on the name Al-Aqsa Mosque. After the Battle of Atin and the fall of Jerusalem, all the Christian forces, especially the Templars, were at their lowest point. They needed more people from the West in order to help to reinstall the power locally. So this was the first task of the order, to sustain the few that were still there and to enforce them. They needed help to survive. This help will arrive thanks to the Third Crusade, financed by a tax christened the Saladin Tithe and collected by the Templars themselves. This crusade mobilized thousands of men. Philip II, King of France, arrives in the Holy Land in April of 1191 with six boats. Richard the Lionheart, King of England, arrives in June with 200 ships and a load of gold. As soon as he arrives, he manages to have one of his closest advisors, Robert de Sablé, elected as Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. For several months, the Crusaders fought against Saladin's troops to recapture the lands lost after the Battle of Hattin. During this third crusade, the island of Cyprus fell into the hands of the Christians, who also managed to retake several cities along the coast, Ascalon, Jaffa, 
Arsuf, Caesarea, Tortosa, Maraclea, and above all, Acre. But Richard the Lionheart and his army failed to retake Jerusalem. The Third Crusade was really neither a success for Saladin or for Richard. On one hand, yes, Saladin had retained Jerusalem, and therefore that was his big goal. But on the other hand, the cost of maintaining his hold on Jerusalem had been extreme. Viewed from Richard's perspective, it also wasn't a success. He hadn't gained Jerusalem. That was the big objective. On September the 2nd, 1192, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin signed the Treaty of Ramla. The Kingdom of Jerusalem is restored, but without Jerusalem. Acre becomes its capital. Saladin dies the following year. And throughout the 13th century, the Templars in the East tried at all costs to defend this strip of Christian land along the Mediterranean coast between Antioch and Ascalon. While the Templars are trying to defend what's left of the Crusader states, the West continues to flourish, at least in the early 13th century. The Templars are able, therefore, to send more money, more troops to the East. However, in the second half of the 13th century, particularly with the rise of a new force called the Mamluks in Egypt, increasing pressure is put on the Crusader states. Slowly, they begin to fall into decline. They've been slowly losing land throughout the 13th century, or well, ever since um, Saladin took Jerusalem in 1187. In fact, the, the Christian kingdom had been shrinking. Despite their prestige in the West and their devotion to defending the Holy Land, despite the money and troops that continue to arrive in the East, the Templars lose more than they gain. And in the West, the first rumblings of criticism emerge. Matthew Paris, an English Benedictine monk and renowned historian of the 13th century, recounts some events during which the courage of the Templars was indeed called into question. In this text, Matthew Paris claims to retranscribe the words of the Count of Artois, who was engaged in the attack on the city of Mansura. According to him, the Knights of the Temple refused to lead the attack at his side, preferring to wait for the rest of the troops to join them, sparking his fury. Oh, ancient Templar treachery. Oh, long-concealed fraud, how openly it erupts now. This whole land of the Orient would have been won long ago if the deceit of the Temple and others who proclaim themselves religious had not impeded us laymen. The Knights Templar and their accomplices are afraid that their dominance, fattened with rich incomes, will eventually expire. In the West, the wealth of the Templars is beginning to vex. Several archives attest to the tensions between the aristocrats and the Templars. Here, Louis IX, King of France, recounts a conflict between the Knights Templar and Thibault IV, King of Navarre and Count of Champagne, over their acquisitions in the county of Champagne and Brie. I, Louis IX, King of France, declare that peace has been restored between our dear cousin Thibault IV, King of Navarre, and the Templars, and that the Templars shall never again make acquisitions in his county of Champagne and Brie, nor in his fiefdoms without his consent. In this additional document, Amaury de la Roche, commander of the Temple in France in 1268, agrees to pay a tax which was, until now, exempted. I, Brother Amaury de la Roche, commander of the Temple in France, declare that Thibault IV, King of Navarre, Count of Champagne and Brie, has granted us an exemption from tax on the transport of 40 barrels of wine to Provence. 
and we accept that if these 40 barrels are exceeded, we will pay the tax according to the custom of Provence. During the 13th century, the donations continue to come in, but criticism also begins to take root. Some landholders become very antagonistic towards the Templars. They see the Templars as pushy landowners, infringing their rights, causing trouble in the West. The Templars are also being defeated a lot on the Crusades, and that too doesn't pass unnoticed. Why should we send money to them when they keep losing? Their vacation, the conquest or retention of Jerusalem, is slipping away. So the Templars' task is to prove that they still have a reason to exist. At the end of the 13th century, the Knights Templar, who still have considerable resources in the West, want to believe that a Christian presence in the East is still possible. Created to protect the Holy Land, the Knights Templar must continue their mission at any cost. If they fail, the Temple Order might simply disappear forever. <laughs> <laughs>